Thank you. Uh, and what a privilege. Um, yeah, so I say, I'm, I lead on the Nuffle Trust. It's an independent uh, think tank. We're effectively a charity. Uh, we're not the gym and we're not the private hospitals. I don't get free uh, access to either of those things. Um, yeah, I lead on NHS workforce issues. We do a bit of work with social care, um, which may be, might make you think, you know, why is he speaking about to, you know, to Hospice UK? Uh, I think there's some cautionary tales here. I think there's some things that have some clear parallels and areas to generalise. Hopefully it's apparent as we go through. Uh, if not, we can pick up on the questions afterwards. Um, but let's give an overview. This is as brief as brief can be as an overview. Uh, four words, you need to plan, allocate, understand, retain. I mean, that's not exhaustive, uh, but they're broadly the themes I wanted to draw out here based on the research that we've, that we've done, I think is relevant. And to go through those, I want to introduce four characters that I think are kind of relevant. They might not be obvious who these are. We've got a knight, we've got an antiquarian bookkeeper, uh, we've got an elephant and we've got a general. So they're going to steer us through these themes. So let's start with the knight. The Right Honourable Sir Henry Willink, who's actually nearly extremely famous in terms of healthcare. Um, born in 1894, uh, by 22 he had commanded a, uh, a battery in the Battle of the Somme. Uh, in 1944, post uh, World War II, following the Beveridge Report, he wrote a National Health Service, proposing a free, at the point of delivery, health service, albeit with a slight difference to the proposals that came a year later under uh, Labour and Nye Bevan, which was uh, publicly organised rather than publicly provided. But that was his sort of, you know, th 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 that was his background. Uh, some years later, in 1960, he was charged with doing something important, to do some workforce planning. Do we need more doctors? Do we need more clinicians? They thought about it hard. They decided, and this is a commission in 1955, that by 1960, we would definitely need fewer doctors. Quite a lot fewer, 12% fewer. His name, albeit not nowadays, but at the time, became a byword for disastrous planning. In some respects, it's a little unfair on him. He wasn't alone. I apologise. This is uh, the standards of extremely difficult things to see. This is just a snapshot of a 1954 BMJ uh, article. BMJ, obviously, never get things wrong. Uh, and this is one occasion uh, uh, they did. They suggest there were too many doctors. And in fact, Four years before that, they, they uh, were saying it's pretty reasonable to suggest we've probably plateaued on the number of doctors we needed. Boy, were they wrong. And I think it's important um, about this workforce planning. In the autumn statement, uh, one of the good gags from it, I guess, was... Uh, uh, the Chancellor Exchequer noting that in his previous role he'd recommended uh, uh, and sort of self-referencing himself about the need for workforce projections. These are necessary, they're not sufficient. You need to know and you need to have some objective idea of what staff you need. Having that data alone will not get you the staff you need. And we know this from history. So let's fast forward from post-war to a decade ago. Uh, so here's a chart. We go from 2012 to 2018. And what, they, what happens here is that Health Education England, charged with making sure that we were training enough staff, asked local bodies, please tell us what you think you need in the future. So let's start. I've greyed out some purple lines. We'll see them in a second. So the, the bold purple line there, that's what trust came back. So the employers came back and said, well, you know what? We probably need about the same number of, uh, this is a, uh, adult nurses next year, but then we're gonna have to get really efficient. So we'll probably need to cut our number of nurses the years after. The following year, sort of slightly 
uh, uh, less bold purple. Um, they sort of realized, actually, we needed more last year than we thought. So we'll start our projections there. And actually, maybe next year we got it wrong. We need, we need more, we mean more nurses next year. So this is in 2013. They're saying 2014, yeah, more nurses. But then we're suddenly going to get efficient and we're going to start cutting the number of nurses we need. They're nothing if not consistent. I guess this is workforce planning. Uh, 2014, they asked the same question. Oh, you know what? We got that wrong. I mean, they got it wrong by a lot, right? They were, they were off by like 10,000 nurses within a year. I mean, that's, that's substantial. We're going to need more next year, but, but then we're going to plateau. Of course, that wasn't the need. There was, you know, the actual demand, the green bar went up. And actually, if you continue, it sort of carries on a reasonably similar trajectory, way off the scale of this chart. There's reasons for these underestimates. They were linked at the time, workforce plans were linked to fairly unrealistic efficiency, so financial targets, which were never going to be achieved and were wholly optimistic. And as a result, they were trying to suppress the actual cost base of, of the services and therefore underestimated um, the number of staff. But there are other reasons why we get our workforce plans wrong. The actual number of staff you need is not just about a sort of a, a sort of objective view of patient need, but also the cost of staff. And throughout the UK, we're not even unclear really what staff are going to cost during this current year, given the pay disputes, let alone uh, in future years. Um, the number of staff can be trumped by manifesto commitments. Um, which will set a different uh, pressure on how many staff you'd need. It can be on unforeseen things uh, like views on safe staffing. The Mid-Staffordshire uh, inquiry precipitated uh, some safe staffing, some advice and a push towards uh, filling unfilled posts. That put a quarter of a billion pound cost pressure on the NHS to fill those posts. It's difficult to predict. Um, and it's also difficult, difficult to predict the supply of staff as well. Who would have known that over a couple of year period, the US were going to start recruiting tens of thousands of nurses, English speaking nurses, who otherwise uh, might have come to the UK uh, a, a decade or so ago. Some of that uncertainty, I guess, is uh, hospices is, uh, to a degree protected from. Um, they sort of probably less likely to be affected by top-down ministerial staffing targets, uh, but much of the uncertainty probably still applies. And even when they get projections, they don't always use them. In 2014, we had a center for workforce intelligence that was sort of embedded within, uh, within the government uh, to advise on how many staff were needed. They said there was uh, likely to be a 30% undersupply of old age psychiatric consultants. The following year, the number of training places for that specialty remained unchanged. Not even by a single junior doctor did they change it. So it's difficult planning, but we have to realize the costs of having too few is not the same as the costs of having too many staff. So you probably want to err on the side of, of caution and have too many. Are there any other tools and techniques to get workforce plans right? You know, most of this is a cautionary tale. There are some things that appear to make sense. A pre-mortem, let's assume you get your workforce plans wrong. Sit in a room, think, we're, look in the future. Let's say we've got them wrong. Why do we think that's happened? Really try to think about what are the factors that are likely to bias your predictions and try to think that through. And when you get them wrong, you have to rely on overseas uh, recruitment. A um, little game of higher or lower here. One in uh, five nurses uh, qualified from outside the UK, GPs, higher or lower. Higher. One in four GPs report a nationality, nationality other than British. Hospital doctors, higher or lower? Higher. One in three. Um, Actually, the NHS as a whole is not a totally 
out of kilter with um, the economy at large. About one in seven across the NHS as a whole report a nationality other than British. It's about one in eight across the economy as a whole. But they're very much centred on some of these clinical professions uh, where there's a far higher proportion. Looking at nurses in particular, this is just, uh, you don't have to look too much in the detail, this is just showing the proportion of UK versus uh, non-UK trained uh, nurses joining the UK register uh, by year. And the orange and green bars is non-UK. So you can see there's been a big increase. It's, it was pretty much half of UK joiners uh, last year. In fact, it accounted for 90% of the net increase. Well, overseas nurses accounted for 90% of the net increase of nurses. And why is that important? Because overseas recruitment might work in some places, geographically, some service types, some types of providers, but is it necessarily gonna work everywhere? There's a large upfront cost maybe 10 to 12,000 pound upfront cost to uh, bring in a nurse, for example, from overseas. But that might be difficult if you're a smaller organization and don't have the sort of the existing infrastructure and resources to do that. Um, I know Toby, you wrote a recent sort of opinion uh, piece and the, the ICS has appeared 24 times in it. And I think a key litmus test here is to what extent, in England, this is specifically, but of course there's analogous sort of organisations, sort of integration type uh, uh, bodies and structures in the other UK nations about, you know, the litmus test for ICS is, can they get this right to work for all services in their, in their local areas and regions? Because we can't just assume that it will happen. Um, and to a large extent, we need some of these overseas recruitments in the short term. Okay, the antiquarian. Uh, this is close to home to me, this one. Uh, John Anthony Westwood, anyone, anyone know who this, might, who this is? You might recognize him, there he is. Full name, John Anthony Portsmouth Football Club Westwood. 60, so he's from, yeah, Portsmouth Football Club, uh, which is where I grew up. Um, 60 Pompey-related tattoos. Uh, the, club, the club crest shaved onto his head. PFC engraved on his teeth. He's a, I mean, he's a proper fan. Um, and uh, he's quite famous because he, he has a loud bell and he, he rings it throughout the whole match, which is quite, a, I think, quite a sort of impressive sporting feat to actually be able to hold that bell that time. Um, it pulls from its peak, sadly, some time ago, 2008. FA Cup winners playing in Europe. They decided the thing to do here was to move, to move John Anthony, uh, Portsmouth and Football Club Westwood, to his own stand. He moved them away from the, from the home end, where he was the heartbeat of the 12th man at Fratton Park. Moved them to a sort of little corner of the stadium with his own, and they sort of thought that was a nice sort of ceremonial thing. But they allocated the staff and the people to the wrong place. Portsmouth's fortunes took a turn for the worse, and they found themselves in the division down soon thereafter. I know association doesn't mean causation. Was it really because of him? But let's let's roll with this. Are you putting your are you putting the people in the right place to get the right results? Again, let's look at history. You can't change your model of care and you won't be efficient unless you put your workforce in the right place. A good example here is the efforts to move staff care outside of hospitals. The 2006 uh, government document, uh, Our Health, Our Care, Our Say, uh, made the, set out the ambition, it wasn't entirely new, but certainly was repeated a lot thereafter, to shift a significant proportion of care outside hospitals. What do they do thereafter? Uh, numbers of hospital consultants increased by a third over eight years. So that's, this time period went from 2006 to 2014. Number of GPs plateaued. I mean, number of GPs pretty much always plateaus nowadays. But this is not, this is not putting in place a workforce to deliver what you want and the changes you want. 
taking a more recent example with the 50,000 nurse commitment uh, made by uh, the government. So again, this is focusing on, on England data. Um, there was actually a pretty large increase in nurses between the uh, election and, and March 2022. I mean, the updated figures look pretty similar to this. Um, I don't remember they've been thinking when they said, well, we need 50,000 more nurses. We're going to shove a lot of them into adults. We probably need fewer learning disability nurses. We probably need fewer health visitors. That's where they were seen full. We probably need fewer practice nurses, so nurses working in general practice. They're the sort of the orange bars. They've actually seen declines over that period. In fact, over a 10-year period, we've seen 24% increase in adult nurses, a two-third increase in children's nurses, but 10% falls in community health, 43% in learning disabilities, fall in mental health nurses, fall in health visitors over that longer 12-year time period. It's again about how we make sure we can attract staff to the settings where they're needed and not just be working off this large sort of aggregate figure. We're doing okay because we've got 20,000 more nurses. But is that working for everywhere? Another quiz question. Um, okay, we've got four lines here. Tracking from uh, 2013 to currently, they are, in no particular order, uh, two relating to social care, care homes and domiciliary care, two relating to the NHS, hospital and general practice. You've got to think through what the order is. And it's this. Might be surprised that. Uh, the giveaway is uh, the social care ones took a big hit uh, around the pandemic, and certainly mid-pandemic. Things, <laughs> vaccine policies didn't pan out too well there. Um, so you had you had had a very large increase in domiciliary care uh, staff up to about 2020, and then a big decrease. Care homes plateaued. General practice, a massive increase. But again, this question, are we getting the right staff in here? Um, there's been a big push for a broader skill mix, which uh, makes a lot of sense. But do we know that general practice is able to onboard this huge influx of new staff types for them and to use them effectively and to make sure they're supported and have the opportunities uh, and training that they need? I mean, I haven't seen 27% more output in general practice, but I don't, I don't, uh, I, I wouldn't push against them saying that, you know, they feel like they're working flat out. So is there an allocation issue going on here? Are we putting the right staff in the right, in the right areas? And this, um, this one almost actually uh, bridges to my next, my next character. Uh, it's a movement between sexes. I apologize for some small writing on this. Um, this is where nurses, NHS nurses are recruited from, and I guess this is pretty relevant to the hospice sector about the sort of transfer between, between sectors. It's a huge number going in and out between the NHS and the private sector. That's on the, the purple uh, section of that donut, um, which is about a quarter, over a fifth anyway. Um, and also a huge amount moving between the public sector as well, 8%, uh, that's sort of that. I'm not entirely sure what the colour is, sort of lightish, reddish colour uh, uh, towards the top. Um, and we have to be very conscious about staff moving between sectors and don't get involved in a zero-sum game uh, where we rob Peter to pay Paul. Uh, an example here is clinical pharmacists. Again, it makes a lot of sense to have a policy to move more clinical pharmacists into general practice. Um, they sought to have 4,500 more of them but where do they where did they come from? You know, you were just taking them out of uh, existing community services, out of the NHS, and it made some of those services less sustainable. So there just needs to be a better understanding of how people move between um, between sectors. Okay, character three. I mean, in some respects, this is a. I'm I'm a bit nervous about making a 
anything even slightly related to wars in here. But, um, but hopefully, the fact that this is Blackadder, hopefully that means I can get away with it. Um, so General Sir Anthony uh, Cecil Montgomery Melchett. Uh, he's constantly trying to lift the morale of his men, rather lamely, with Charlie Chaplin films, putting on a drag act, uh, completely ignorant of their spirit, with no concept of his soldiers' well-being. And is shown to have little or no compassion. But what does motivate, attract, uh, retain and recruit staff? Do we have a good idea of what motivates the people who work in our services? Um, I went to an actually excellent uh, presentation earlier uh, this afternoon. Um, and I think it's Paul Knott, uh, his name, talking about what really matters and really focusing on it. And he sort of mentioned if you're you know, in job adverts, focus on things like parental leave, pensions, that's what people look at. I think that's true. Um, I think some of the small things matter too, actually. I would push back a bit on that. And I certainly would, in terms of what people value, play to our understanding of behavioral psychology. People hate losing things. And we learned during COVID, some of the little perks helped. How people felt they were valued, they helped. It's not useful at all to take those away. You get like a double loss in that. Um, I think there's also a lesson here that valuing people derive their value by looking at how they compare to others. It's sort of a relative assessment. And in the UK, it's tricky because we have huge pay differentials across 26 countries with comparable data. We're second only to Korea in our uh, disparity between nurse and senior doctor pay and considerably above the average on that. So there's a pay thing and there's also conditions. We look through uh, for one of our pieces of work hundreds of job adverts to see how people were trying to sell types of jobs. That was particularly focused on clinical support staff. It was very much, you know, all of the asks were of the person applying for the job. You're, you, in one case, they were even asking them to pay for some of the certification they would need for the job, demanding flexibility from day one. You, you compare that and contrast it to a typical NHS consultant uh, job advert, where the entire opposite is, is true. They, they, they will sell it on the point of access to, uh, to training and flexibility from day one. And so I think on that value thing, I think we need to be very careful about given the inevitable fact that we have these sort of multidisciplinary teams and different professions in it, that we are treating people fairly. Um, again, sorry if, sorry if it's a bit small, uh, particularly towards the back. Um, but I will, t I will talk you through some of the, the numbers, so don't worry if you can't see them uh, particularly. Uh, this is data on why people leave their roles in the NHS. The biggest reason is unknown, um, which is not great. I mean, this is data that's set up. I mean, you should be doing an exit interview, and if you can't fill in a single reason, that's putting you at a bit of a disadvantage. And uh, just now, there was a you know there was a presentation on data, and it was a it was a packed room because. I guess either you all really care about data or, or otherwise you're all really nervous that you need to know a little bit more about data. But there's a lot of people who went in there wanting to listen about data and recognising the importance of data. And maybe this is where the hospice sector can uh, sort of get ahead of the game here. Use your agility to outperform the NHS and understanding why people, where people join from, why they join, where people leave and why they leave. Um, there's some interesting other things going on with this with this data, which I suspect um, you can you can generalise to, to to your workforce as well. Work-life balance is pretty much the same as retirement uh, in the latest set of data. It used to be a quarter of retirement, um, so it is a hugely more important issue. When you try to unpick what work-life balance is, there's some, I guess, some slightly sort of harder reasons behind that. Um, about people feeling exhausted under too much pressure. Um, that's when you separately, there's a survey of why nurses leave the register. Issues like that uh, seem to pop out. Uh, there's a purple bar in there, which is, um, sorry, not very well labeled, um, which is, I mean, fairly small in, in absolute numbers, which is, but it's health. 
and that's increased fourfold uh, in recent years as a, as a proportion of why people leave. And actually, there was some interesting analysis published last, last month about the likelihood of uh, clinical support staff and of nurses leaving their job after, within a few months of having either uh, some absence due to physical illness or for mental uh, health reasons. Which is concerning. I mean, the only positive you can take from that is that it's clear how you would do an intervention. You know when someone's been off, so you know what the trigger point is to try to address that, to make sure that there isn't some preventable uh, attrition and retention issues going on. Um, feeling undervalued. It's one of the key reasons why people leave the nursing register. I think we sort of mentioned about how, you know, how, how do you go about valuing people. Uh, low staffing levels is another reason why people, that's when, ask, when you ask people why they're thinking of leaving, low staffing levels. If you haven't got enough staff, at least give people confidence that the cavalry is coming, that there is a plan to address it. Um, some of the other reasons about retention that we find in our research, um, feeling engaged with the organisation, that appears to be pretty strongly associated with better retention issues. Um, social care. Um, I mean, it's even more limited, the information on social care leavers. Uh, but they did survey uh, different providers, 9,000 adult social care settings, and asked them what their top reasons for leaving, uh, for their staff leaving were. Uh, the ones I've just highlighted in red, again, you don't have to read the specific numbers, they're about uh, better pay. I mean, it's a different sector, social care. You can you expect different reasons to the NHS. Um, and the ones highlighted in green, they're about uh, working conditions, both with, you know, they're leaving because of best conditions in other providers or outside of social care. Separately, the work we've done there, um, Burnout stress is very important as a reason for leaving. Um, as I say, issues around pay and progression. Um, and there's some exploratory analysis which is really quite interesting, which points to this whole professionalization piece. And I know there was a talk earlier about how you offer people career progression, um, the use of things like advanced practice uh, in nursing and other professions, um, use of credentialing to give people some sort of career pathway. You know, I recognize it's early well, it's, in some ways, it's not early days on those, but it's a, it's, a, it's a developing area. There's question marks over the extent to which there needs to be some regulation on that. Currently, there's putting a lot of pressure and responsibility on providers, and to what extent can nationally some of that responsibility be, uh, be taken up. Um, but just on that professionalization piece, um, lack of a relevant social care qualification was pretty strongly related to people leaving um, the care service. Uh, less access to training, again, a key reason why people might, uh, might, be leave, might leave. Um, actually, the second reason at the time why people left was uh, did not wish to be vaccinated. That speaks to the time when this survey was done, when they were bringing in the vaccination rules. Uh, one thing I would say on that is when we looked at the impact assessment on vaccinations, the numbers didn't even add up. I mean, here's a lesson here. If you're going to bring in a policy which is going to affect your workforce, make your numbers add up and do your due diligence before you implement it. I sort of mentioned about what people value um, and partly it's about you know, understanding people's motivation, uh, why they might join. Um, and we did quite a bit of work looking particularly at the non-medical workforce about why people choose to, uh, to pursue uh, careers, sort of clinical careers. Um, typically, it's not about pay. That's not very high up there. Um, they, typically, it's about sort of the exposure people have had. I think it's important to be quite conscious of that, that people will be taking, whether it's you know, for them personally or seeing how uh, relatives uh, uh, or, or, or you know, people a few degrees of separation away from them are cared for will affect their career decisions. And even things like exposure at school. So, you know, at careers events, do people actually know what, uh, what the sector is and what the types of uh, jobs are? That, that does seem to have a very material effect on it. 
Um, but really, I mean, that chart in itself, that's all that's showing is that there's a huge attrition during training. For every 10 nurses that, uh, 10, 10 uh, nurse training posts, you get about six full-time equivalent joiners to the NHS, and we don't really have a good understanding where the rest of them go, to what extent is it, such as like um, hospice care or, 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 or other services. And it's, it's just this need to have a better understanding of what, what is motivating people. And let's not just use pay as a proxy. I mean, pay is important. I mean, particularly in the current context. Um, uh, but it, but it is, a, is a very crude proxy and, and, and measure for, for valuing people. Okay, fun character. Uh, this might not be obvious. I hope that's a, I, I hope you can see an elephant within that. Um, so the parable of the blind man and the elephant. Uh, I mean, there's different versions of this, uh, but the story uh, of a group of blind men who have never come across an elephant before and learn uh, and imagine what an elephant is by touching it. Some might get the tusk, some the leg, some the tail, some seem to have jumped on the back. And in various versions of this, they sort of share their stories. And sometimes they come to blows because they just cannot believe what the other person is telling them. And they find it quite upsetting. And so, uh, so uh, trouble, trouble breaks out. And I guess the story from the parable is about be cautious of limited subjective experience and make sure you have a full understanding of what's going on. And to get a good understanding of the workforce challenge, a single tusk won't do. What is, the, what is the workforce shortage? I mean, I don't know. Um, and whenever someone says in the NHS, for example, that it's 100,000, they actually don't know. There's a number that we need that's subjective. There's a number of funded post your establishment. There's a number of of those posts that are actively being recruited for. Sometimes you won't actually be sort of actively trying to recruit for your funded post because you don't think you're going to fill them. Then there's some that are filled, and then there's some that's filled permanently. The most commonly cited figure on the NHS shortage, for example, covers a bit of that. Probably we want to know a different measure altogether. I mean, we try to work it out even for a snapshot day. Um, we think once you account for, and also when people talk about shortfalls, they're not, they're not mentioning about what's the gap actually in the rotor on that given day. Is a patient or someone receiving care, I'm bothered about whether there's someone available to provide to me, whether it's because of a vacancy or whether it's because of sickness or another reason for, for absence. And none of this, you know, when people talk about vacancies, that's all too often left out. Um, we think for nurses on a given day, it might be about 17,000, something like that. But it's, I mean, it's pretty finger of the ass uh, stuff to even get close to it. When we talk about having a full understanding of the workforce, again, you know, often we just talk about those permanently employed. Uh, one pound in every five uh, in the NHS is spent on either temporary staff or outsourced staff. If you don't understand those and understand their conditions and understand their motivation, you haven't got a good understanding of the workforce. And if you don't have a good understanding of the workforce, uh, you make mistakes. So here's a, here's a final cautionary tale to, uh, to end with. And this is using contractual changes. Uh, again, this is um, a little bit England focus, although some of these contracts uh, were used in the other nations as well. Um, clinical grading brought in in 1988. They didn't really understand what people did or how best to reflect their grades. You had a hundred, well, after they brought it in, you had a hundred thousand people contesting what pay level they were put on. Fast forward to 2003, a new uh, NHS consultant contract brought in. They underestimated workload considerably uh, and therefore didn't get the capacity at all right or cost right. Same when they looked at when they changed the main G, uh, GP contract, the GMS contract. Um, they misunderstood what GPs did and what incentivised them, and it cost them two billion pounds uh, for making that mistake. And then a gender for change contract covering the majority of uh, NHS staff, 
um, they didn't even really confer what they were trying to achieve with that contract, uh, let alone try to get the results they needed from it. So there we go. Uh, four characters, uh, four or possibly more cautionary tales. Um, yeah, I hope, I, ho I hope there's some clear parallels with the more specific workforce uh, you have, but maybe we can pick those up in the questions. Thank you very much, Billy. I think, I think those cautionary tales will resonate very strongly and powerfully with, with many of the people in this, in this room. And as you say, um, uh, the relationship, uh, I think there is, a, there is a huge amount to learn from the challenges and pressures that are facing the NHS in isolation. Um, the hospice sector obviously has a symbiotic relationship with the, with the NHS, the flow of staff back and forth across the two different sectors is, is, is very significant. I'm going to come, come to a few questions, but, but just to kick off, I, um, I was struck particularly by your comment around, around the dangers of, of limited subjective experience to, to, as the basis for uh, making sort of decisions. And I wonder whether you think, whether you're optimistic about uh, the potential of, certainly within England, the new approach to integration, to, to system level planning, and whether you see that as a, as a potential uh, path to, to thinking about some of these more strategic workforce challenges that the sectors, that the system as a whole is facing. Am I optimistic? I mean, is this working? Um, I guess the question probably should be really to the audience. To what extent do you feel integration is working for you and your voice is being heard across all those different um, bodies. And if not, then it's, I mean, it's, we're not in a very optimistic scenario. I mean, every time we engage in these sort of integration style policies and speak to people who are trying to implement it, there's, a, there's an awful amount of goodwill and effort that goes into it. But I remain pretty concerned unless there's clear governance. Are we really aligning the funding the responsibilities and the accountabilities correctly because if not when push comes to shove you probably won't get the results you need and I know taking the England example about ICS's it's still they're still ironing those out to some extent so I hope that that's taken seriously because unless you get the unless you get that governance right at a national level within the legislation or the guidance around it then all you end up having is a lot of local conversations trying to work it out themselves, and that's not very helpful. That's not, you know, the positive drive that we need. So, I mean, there's goodwill out there. I mean, you know, it's bringing people together in the room. I remain concerned that the governance isn't supporting the right decisions at the end of it. Thank you. I mean, I want to be more optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to come to a question from from Mark Jarman Howe, who who points out the the fact that the acute sector is is such a sponge, is such a drawer in terms of resource and staffing. Um, and those, those finite resources are very much needed in the community. And, and Mark's question is, is should, should hospices as a sector really be targeting NHS staff to, to leverage our relative benefits to address the workforce pressures that hospices are facing um, and to then force, in a, in a way, force the realignment of resources that uh, that is needed anyway. Um, just wonder what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I, I guess the characterization of them is a sponge. I mean, if you look at the numbers, they, that's where you've had these big increases in, in staff and they're only going to be demanding more given the elective backlog, for example, which slightly pushes against the policy ambitions to move things out of hospital. So, I mean, what can you do here? You, you know, you have to compete, be more agile, and maybe help the NHS move forward, have a better understanding of why people are joining and where they join from, have a better understanding when people are leaving, um, why they're leaving, um, because the NHS doesn't have a great understanding of that. I mean, some local trusts certainly do, but that sort of national policy picture, they certainly don't, and, and, and others seem to be struggling. So, I mean, yeah, so, uh, you know, the, the, to some degree, there's a finite set of uh, resources. It is a bit of a zero-sum game at the moment. I mean, unless that issue of like, can, 
can you get that regional and local level of collaboration to work, to, to get things like international recruitment working, to get a more, um, uh, I guess, try to pull, try to recruit from a larger pool uh, of people, getting things like the apprenticeship schemes to work, which are really tough because, I mean, depending on the apprenticeship scheme being used, it can be financially uh, not a great uh, uh, option compared to other ways of bringing new staff in. Um, but these are all things that, you know, potentially with some national, regional, and local intervention, they, it could work to actually, I've almost said make the pie bigger, but I recognize that's um, a loaded turn of phrase nowadays, but um, to actually to grow the size of the workforce. Thank you very much. We're going to come to a question from Sonia O'Leary, who asks, whether the fact that so many people who apply to do their nurse training and don't get a place demonstrate that we don't have the right resources in place or indeed the right approach to, to training in order to equip our workforce for the future. Yeah, it's been, it's been pushed forward as an idea. There was, um, I think it was in the long, the NHS long-term plan. They sort of made this point that there's a lot of people applying who don't get a place. Therefore, if you just open up to more places. I'd be a little bit cautious about the implication that anyone who applying, and I know the person who's written this and not saying that, but I'm nervous about the implication that anyone applying um, could just, you know, sh should be accepted. I mean, there are requirements and capabilities um, that you're looking for, for someone training to be a nurse and, and all these other clinical professions. I mean, certainly there's, um, there are some bottlenecks that are stopping us training more. Um, in large places of the country, there are not all the routes available in for nursing, and in particular, when you start looking at the different fields of nursing, so learning disability, mental health nursing, um, you, you don't always have postgraduate routes available. Certainly, the apprenticeship one is you know, pretty, a pretty early stage of that development. Um, so we could be doing more to improve access to those training courses and therefore get more coming through the domestic supply. But also you've got to make sure when people have a good experience when they're training, so they want to join the service afterwards, we're losing way too many. And we've just, um, we're going to publish some work maybe in a, a month or two's time about this, about what you can do about this attrition during training. Um, because frightening the numbers, particularly actually for, for doctors, uh, because it's expensive to train for the individual themselves and for the public purse, and even for the providers who are putting on clinical placements. And if you're not getting that right and getting people through, then you know, that's a big waste. But if you get it right, you see an, you potentially see an instant result. I mean, a lot of people say, you know, oh, but it takes you know, 15 years to train a consultant. Well, actually, there's some who will be finishing, you know, finishing their medical training next year, make sure they have a good experience, so then they join the service thereafter. It's, you know, it's an instant reaction if you get that, if you get that right. Did that answer the question at all then? Mm. Very, yep, thank you very much. Got time for, for, for one, one final question. Um, and I'm, uh, you noted how important it is to, to, uh, to be cautious around pay as a, as, as, as a driver, but inevitably uh, coming to a, to a question around, around pay from, from David Houston. Um, and he asked whether you could expand on your views on NHS terms and conditions, including the pa how that package compares to other Western countries, and, and whether you have any reflections on what you think is likely to happen with the current pay dispute, and then or by extension, the potential implications for, for this sector as well. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, was, why did I say pay? Um, okay, well done for picking me up on that. Um, I think whilst I've been at this conference, we've actually, as an organization, we've just published something uh, just as a bit of an explainer on uh, the whole pay uh, arguments at the moment, because it's tricky, because you're hearing a lot from different organisations who have some skin in the game. What we have said is the current pay process setting process uh, is not a good one. I mean, it's clear route for improvement. The fact that they are just passive recipients of evidence rather than actively commissioning research that will try to answer some of these questions about what is, you know, what, what will affect people's, what, what will affect re retention, recruitment. 
there's also an issue in terms of the fact that you have different pay setting bodies for consultants and for and some of the other medical groups and for agenda for change. So they, they have this argument that oh, if we increase agenda for change pay bill by an extra 1%, that would be half a billion, therefore it's not affordable as well. But if you split those all up into separate professions, then suddenly it would look affordable to do it. So it's kind of, it makes really no sense. And that's not a fair argument. Um, so I think there's an, there's an issue about the, that process. I think when you, I mean, it's difficult to talk about pay given the current rates of inflation. Um, which make any pay deal still, you know, a massive real terms cut. But pre, the, pre the inflationary issues, one of the key problems was around pay progression. Um, so there's, some various, there's been various analysis around this, uh, looking at how uh, getting different clinical uh, uh, professions affect your career earnings at you know, one year, five years, 10 years. And it's when you get that later stage and suddenly nursing, for example, really falls behind. So there needs to be some better efforts to support progression. The current pay deal, I mean, they did the most, they, they recognize that you've got lots of experienced nurses sitting at the top of their pay band. Uh, and so they said, well, rather than giving this 1,400 pounds, we'll give them 4%. So I said, like, well, is that much different? So we, we worked it out and we did up to what tax would be. And so for those sitting at the top of band six, that's worth 43p a day. I mean, I mean, that doesn't even buy you a Mars bar. I mean, if they think that's really going to change the behaviors uh, of these very valuable experienced clinicians, uh, then I just think they're mistaken. Um, so they need, to think, they need to think a bit more uh, clearly about that progression. Article. And they need to think about I sort of said it before about the relative pay point. We're increasingly getting people to work in these multidisciplinary teams. We're having people share um, you know, patient lists even. Uh, and, if, and you can't expect people to do that and be happy walking home when they know they're having to work a, you know, a five day week to earn as much as someone working one and a half days, which can, you know, can be some of the differentials you're getting between uh, different cl uh, clinical professions. So there's, so there's some real issues with, uh, with that. I mean, also you've got to make sure it's affordable. You've got to make sure it's affordable, not only for the providers in the NHS, but there's also an implication for uh, all those employing similar staff or potentially the, you know, what would be the same staff in, in other sectors. I mean, that has a, a huge sort of cost implication. Um, and I'm not sure that's always thought through from the deliberations I see it now in that pay process. I think that's a, that's a point that will resonate very strongly with, with, with delegates in the room. So um, we are out of time for this session, but, but um, Billy, thank you so much for sharing your, your thoughts and your reflections. I think, um, as you say, some very significant cautionary tales for us as we navigate a path forward into this brave new world of, of, um, of uh, integration, collaboration, system level working, uh, which of course requires integration, collaboration, system level working and thinking in terms of workforce planning as well, which um, I think at this point has been in relative short, su short supply. But um, Billy, thank you so much. Can we, can we thank, you, thank Billy for his time? That brings us to the end of, of the formal part of today's proceedings, but I do hope that you will join us in Hall 2 for the Lord Provost hosted civic reception um, and look forward to seeing you there. <laughs>